situation you may be in, you just need some prayer, um, and sometimes you just um, need prayer because you're happy and you're in a good place with God, and um, yeah, um, so we have our prayer team on our sides here, and if you feel led, if God's telling you that you need somebody to pray with you, then um, they're over there.
Today we're in a new series, okay? We, we're, we're titling this series Storytellers, and we're actually going to look at some of the parables of Jesus. And it's funny, in talking with Joe, Pastor Joe, I was like, uh, man, there's two that I always default to. And uh, he was laughing with me. He said, yeah, I, I pretty much know where you're going. And I was like, okay, I'm going totally different. But I had sat in my office this week, and I'm looking through, and I'm like, man, why can't I go to the two I normally go to? <laughs> I got notes after notes after notes. Anyway, we're going to go somewhere totally different, totally different. When was the first time that you can remember, and you, you'll have to fill in this blank, the first time you, you can remember thinking, if only I had, fill in the blank, I would be happy. Maybe it's, you can think back to when you were a child, and for me, it was a toy. If I only had this one toy, I'd be happy. Or for a teenager, maybe if I just had that truck, I'd be happy. Or for an adult, maybe if I just had that house, I'd be happy. You know, and there's this, there's this place that we can all go where we associate happiness with the stuff that we have, the things that we have. And, man, I'm looking around this room, and some of you are like, uh-oh, where's he going? I'm going to step on some toes today. But here's the thing. If you're a guest, which I know there's guests in here, I have this big heart. There's times I'll cry for the Lord. I'll cry because my daughter who was up here worshiping is going to leave me at the end of the month. Um, but she's going away because God's called her to do something special. But I have this heart of compassion, but I also have this heart where I want God to challenge who I am as a person. And I want him to challenge us. Because we live in a time such as this where there is so many things that try and pull us away from what God is trying to pull us into. Amen, church? Amen. And I want to I preface this. It's not that money and stuff isn't important. In fact, there's some things that we all need. You know, it's great that we have a roof over us, clothes to wear, food on the table. So I want you to hear my heart that it's not wrong to have stuff. But if stuff takes the priority, then there's an imbalance in our lives, right? You know, and there's times that we can have this tendency to, to elevate money, to elevate the things that we have. And we can deceive ourselves where all of a sudden it becomes about the stuff instead of about the one. I'll say that again, instead of about the one, the one. So today we're going to look, we're going to look at the rich fool. Now I'll tell you this, I've read it, I don't know how many times I've read it, I have never spoken on this. So I pray that God challenges not only myself, 
which he already has, but I, I pray that he challenges all of us. You know, because in this story, it will challenge us to rethink what it means to truly be rich. And it will call us to live life for what matters most. So turn to Luke chapter 12. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope you have a good day. Uh, that's all I need is just that hooray in the beginning. Dude, he's high-fiving somebody. So this is, this is a great passage. Um, Jesus is, you know, he's addressing the crowd, and someone interrupts him and asks him to settle this inheritance dispute. And Jesus responds not with this, this legal judgment, but a story that cuts to the heart of the issue. What do we treasure most in life? You know, for all you note takers, I want you, to, I want you to put that down because this is something that I've been thinking about, you know, over the week. What do I treasure most in life? And I'm the same as all of you. There's times where my mind can go to 20 different places, but I, I pray that God always brings me back to that place of putting things into perspective because without him, Everything else falls to pieces. Everything else falls to pieces. So we're in Luke. And uh, I'm actually going to read out of the NLT because I just, some of the verbiage is, is pretty awesome. It says, then someone called from the crowd, teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, friend, who made me judge who made me judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told a story. A rich man had, fer had a fertile farm that produced fine crop. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have enough room for all my crop. Then he said, I know. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have enough room to store my wheat and other goods. And I will sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. And here's the kicker. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you've worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. That's how I was. I read that, and I'm just like, oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord. You know, we all love those, those great sermons of, you know, God blessing us, and, and God's always there, and God's doing this. And then you read a, you read a passage like that. And it's in red in my Bible. And Jesus is like, okay, here it comes. You know, but it's great because I think there's times that we need Jesus to stop us in our tracks and say, hold up. Your priorities, they're going off track from what I've called you to do. And I just love this, you know, verse 16 through 19, you know, just confronting the attitude in the heart of this man. And the first thing we see, and I'm going to have a few points up here. Point number one, the illusion of security. The illusion of security. And the first thing we see is, is there's, this, there's this thing that's taking place in this rich man. The rich man believes that his abundance, this harvest, guarantees his future. Here's the reality, church. Nothing guarantees your future. Nothing. Nothing. The only one that will guarantee anything in life is Jesus. It's him and him alone. That is the guarantee. You know, he thinks that he's set up for life. And I want to challenge us. How many of us have fallen into that same trap? Where because our bank account is good and because we, we have a good house and we have a car and, and everything's great, there's times that we're like... Oh, I, this is good. It's all good. And we fall into that trap that this is our security. 
This is our security. I, I want to tell a story, but where's my wife? My wife, I, I can't tell the story because I know my wife is, is in the back checking up on some things. And just so you all know, there's probably five TVs back there right now that are, that are showing everything. But it made me, think of, made, it, made me think of a story about a person in our family. And dude, just, just breaks your heart. You know, we believe that if we just have enough money, if we have the right job, if we have the perfect home, everything's going to be fine. You know, and we, we have this tendency just to look at the stuff that we've amassed. And I'll say this, it, it's not that God doesn't want to bless you, and it's not that God doesn't want you to have a great job. He does. He wants you to have a good house. He wants you to have security. But the thing is, when there's this, this out of balance, and we live in a world where it's out of balance, where it's all about me and what I can amass, and we lose focus on him, and the rich man compared his wealth and all of that. That was his safety. That was his comfort. But Jesus warns us, material wealth can never be the ultimate security in your life. I want you to write this down because this just this stopped and it made me just think over and over. The problem isn't that the man's rich. That's not the problem. It's that he places his trust in the riches instead of in God. You see, that was where he messed up. God was the one that blessed him, but he couldn't see that. His eyes was on everything that he has. And we live in a culture where it's easy to live in this lie that more is always better. But here's the truth. More stuff never equals more peace. In fact, I would say it's probably the opposite. You know, the more stuff that you're juggling, the more stuff that you're trying to balance, it's like, man, where's the peace in all of this? And I think when we give it to God with open hands, because he's the one that blessed us, I think then that peace comes. Because the reality is it was never mine in the first place. It was always his. He was the one that blessed me. He's the one that put it in. And, and here's, here's something that's going to go against our culture. He's the one that put it in, and I should allow him to be the one that takes it out. You see, you're blessed to be a blessing. God gives so you can give to somebody else that will look and say, Brad, why did you do that? Why did you do that? And you're going to be like, because it was God's. And that could be the seed that changes the whole mentality of the person that you're in front of. Man, that one in my notes, I like that. I'm on Lord. True security doesn't come from accumulating wealth, but trusting in God. And here's the beauty. He promises that he will provide for our needs. That's a promise. And Jesus warns us that, that greed never satisfies satisfies. If we focus on just accumulating the stuff, man, it's going to get us all over the place. Church, let's remember that everything that you and I have comes from him. It comes from him. James 1.17 says it like this, what is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God the Father. Your blessings, as much as there's times we want to take credit for, well, yeah, but I worked hard for this. But here's the thing. God put you in the position to work hard for that. God gave you it. Instead of asking how we can store more, let's ask how we can give more. Man, God's stepping all over my feet. I love that, though, you know? I mean, preachers shouldn't be up here for the sake of preaching. It's like, man, if God's not challenging me, I just, I want to sit down and hang out because somebody else can do it better. 
Point number two, the deception of self-sufficiency. The deception of self-sufficiency. See, notice how the rich man talks to himself. It's, I will do this. I will store my grain. I'll take it easy. Man, I'll kick back. It's all about him. And his focus is so on him and what he's going to do, what he's going to achieve, how he's going to play this whole thing out. There's no mention of God in there. There is no mention of God, no gratitude, no consideration for others. He falls into this trap of self-sufficiency. And the danger of self-sufficiency is it blinds us to our dependency on God. Man, I've got that bolded and highlighted in here. Because I'm like, you know what? Yes. Yes, God. When we rely on our resources, our wisdom, we miss the opportunity to partner with God in what he wants to do, his great plan. See, the rich man's focus was on his ability and his achievement, not on the one that blessed him in the first place. See, I believe this story, if it was flipped the other way, God blessed him. He could have blessed so many around him. I mean, you think of the, just the testimony of just giving out what that would have done for the kingdom. We live in a world that places so much on self-reliance. We hear things like, believe in yourself. You can do anything you set your mind to. Now, here's the thing. Self-confidence, that's not bad. It's not bad to have that confidence within yourself. But when it turns to self-reliancy or self-sufficiency, we remove God from the equation. You see, because then I, I step into this place where, man, I, I, I can do this on my own. I don't need God because look what I've achieved. And I will say this to each one of us in here. None of us are out of harm's way when it comes to the enemy deceiving us that, hey, you can do this and you don't need God. I will stand and testify. There was a point in my life where I said, I can do this and I don't need God to help me. Okay, I can mess stuff up and call it good. But the thing is, it was that head-on collision with Christ that I knew, man, I can't, I can't do this on my own. I cannot do life without him. Somebody needs to hear that today. You will never do life on your own the right way. But I encourage you this. If you partner with Christ, you will succeed. Everything that you do will be a plus in your life because he'll be there with you. Now, is it going to be easy? No. In fact, some of the hardest times in my life I've been walking with Christ. But you know what? I'm a better person for it. It's made me a better person. And I'm saying that to you. It will make you a better person. Who you are called to be is to do life with him. You were never designed to do life on your own. You see, and we live in this world that places so much value on wealth and success. But Jesus reminds us, this is all temporary. This is all temporary. Matthew 6, 19 and 20 talks about do not store up treasures here on earth where moth eats and rust destroys them, where thieves come in and steal it. You see, because this is, this is what happens. If it's out of God's blessing, you're going to lose it. If it's in God's blessing, he's going to use it for his kingdom. But you have to have your priorities right. Our true security and worth does not come from what we own, but from a relationship with God. I mean, you can take that, you can stamp that on your fridge. See, let us hold our possessions loosely and just allow him to do what he wants to do for the eternal purpose. I 
love reading through my notes. Did you really say that, God? <laughs> Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You know, I just, I love this verse. It says, we're reminded to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Lean not on your own understanding. and all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Such a great truth from God's word. And the rich man, what did he lean on? He leaned on his own understanding, and that was his downfall. How many times, and you don't need to put your hands up, how many times have you, have you lent on your own thinker and for it just to go south? It's like, man, I thought that was a great idea. And there's times in God's humor, I think he sat up there just belly rolling like, dude, you thought that was good? Oh, my word, you were so far from the mark, so far from the mark. You see, trusting in God means that we acknowledge that everything we have comes from him and that it's ultimately him supplying the need. And it might not necessarily be the need that you and I need right there and then, a whole lot of needs, but it might be in your hands to bless somebody else. See, you can't rely on yourself. If we rely on ourselves, we miss out on the abundant life that Christ came to promise you and I. We were never meant to do life alone, and God desires us to have these resources, but to get, pull from Him. The strength comes from Him. He's the one that has to guide us with these riches. You see, if we don't depend on Him, it's not going to work out for you and I. Let me ask you this. Ken, I'm not looking at anybody. Are there areas in your life where you've become self-sufficient? And this isn't a guilt trip, and this isn't the point fingers. I mean, I, I've been guilty of it. I will stand here and say, yeah, I've relied on myself in this area. And it wasn't that God's like, oh, man, I'm going to take you out back and I'm going to whoop on you because you're a bad boy. God was like, Sean, just trust in me in this area. Just trust in me. You see, because that's the heart of the Father. It's like, just trust me. Just trust me. I will walk you through this. And you will see it will be so much better than what you thought. You know, perhaps we've, we've achieved success and we forgot that about the one who enabled the success. Let us remember to invite God into every aspect of our lives, seeking his guidance and his direction for all that we do, for all that we do. Now, I laugh because Pastor Joe says this from time to time. It's, like, it's not like you have to pray for what cereal you're buying in Ridley's. Or maybe you got diabetes, so you might want to pray for the cereal you're buying at Ridley's. You know, but, I mean, there's times where, there's times where we re rely on our own stinking thinking instead of submitting it to God, saying, hey, you know, I, I want your input on this. God, I want to partner with you on this situation. How should, how should I go about this? Should I, is it straightforward? Are we, we going to the left? We going to the right? Or do you just want me to pause for a minute and just meditate on what you're saying? Instead, man, we're like, oh, dude, we're a bull in a china shop. I'm running 100 miles an hour, and I'm smashing everything around me. God's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's talk about this. Man, someone once told me the smartest person in the room is usually the quietest. Dude, you're all quiet. I'm like, man, ouch. But you know, there's times I think it, it's a good thing to remember. There's times that I think God wants us just, hey, can you stop talking for a minute and just listen how we're going to do this? Point number three. The tragedy, the tra ooh, the tragedy, I can't even say the word. 
the tragedy, there you go, of misplaced priorities. There's always one word, right? It's one more one word. Verse 20. Okay, I want you to go back and look at that. See, this is misplaced priorities. Verse 20, God says to the rich man, you fool. You will die this very night. Then who gets everything that you've worked for? Okay, so I had this. I had this family member that, man, just such a, Such a phenomenal person. But man, he spent so much of his life trying to get more stuff. You see, there was a call on his life. And he put the call to one side because it, it became about what he could get. It became about the house, the land, my retirement. All of this stuff. And man, he died and left it all behind. And he died way before his time. Way before his time. You know, and as I was reading this, I was thinking, man, you, you had so much focus on the stuff that you missed what God wanted to do in and through your stuff. And there was times when he plugged in and man, it's like, dude, this is awesome to see God working in his life. And he would bless people. But then the enemy would get in there and be like, man, it's about your stuff. You need to keep building for you. And man, I look at that and I think, dude, so deceived. So deceived. Now, did he make it home? Yeah, he made it home. But I think here on earth, he missed the mark. He missed the mark because God had a plan, and he didn't walk the plan. You know, and I say that because there's somebody in this room today that, that God's, God has a plan. And I know there's times in church, it, you know, it's that, that cliche of, oh, yeah, God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your life. And the thing is, the enemy in the world's telling you that there's a different plan. And there's times that you find yourself, you catch yourself in this place where, is that the way I'm meant to go? Or, or, or is this the way I'm meant to go? I'm saying this, that God is going to clearly speak to you and tell you this is the plan. And here's what I'm saying, don't miss the plan that God has for you. Because here's the thing, if you seek him first, everything's going to come into alignment. He will bless you. He will move you into that place that you are meant to be in. Because it's his plan and his design. The rich man spent his life storing up these treasures on earth only to lose everything in an instant. And here's the thing, you and I don't know how much time we have. And here's the reality check. If you're spending all your time investing it into stuff, and I'll say this, young people, if you're spending all your time investing it into that other person, here's the thing, if it's not God telling you to invest in that other person because this is your future, guess what? You need to get off of that bus and get on my train. Boop, boop. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't in my notes. <laughs> but Jesus concludes the parable in verse 21. Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have riches in God. You see, and I think this is, this is the thing. You can gain it all and lose it all. It's not he who has the most toys wins. It's he who has Christ wins, period. I mean, if I had a microphone, it's that boom. 
And the same guy will be like, no. Being rich towards God means prioritizing what he values. Relationship. Generosity. Love. Your resources for his service. That's what God values. My prayer is for us. That we, we don't just hear this. When we leave this place, we understand that God's priority in my life is that I build relationships, that I'm generous, and that I love people. You know, the Bible says they'll know us because of our love for one another. God help us if we miss that. I think God's challenging the church. You need to get back to that. You need to get back to that. You see, life is too short to do it, on our, your, uh, do it on your own. We don't know how much time we have, so invest in what matters in life. What are you investing in? What's your mindset on eternity? Or are you just caught up on, on this stuff that I have now, this short-lived pursuit of what the world has for me? You see, I want to be an... Int- Eternal-minded person. I want to be a kingdom-minded person. Because here's the thing. If I walk out this place and get struck by lightning, it's not going to happen because I'm God's favorite. <laughs> but I want to know that, that I've done what God's called me to do. Here's the thing. I never came in this room today to stand on somebody's toes. But here's the thing. I'm begging you, don't get lost in the world. Get lost in the Holy Spirit. Get lost in what Jesus has for your life. Get lost in what God wants to do through you. He spits everywhere. We'll edit that out. Being rich towards God means investing in what's going to last. See, our relationship with Him should have an impact on those around us. Man, I remember, (laughs) I remember when I was a, I was a new Christian. And I was like, yeah, I'm in love with the Lord. And I remember, you know, there's times that you're a walking billboard for God. Dude, I think my billboard had some profanity on it. It's like, dude, you're not a good witness. You know, but I challenge us. I mean, man, there's somebody looking to you. They're watching how you live life for God. This man, you know, are you going to be that, that person that's, you know, you're so on fire that people get around you. And I'm like, man, I, I, I want some of that. I want what they've got. Or are you going to be the kind of person that stands there and, man, you're such a fill-in-the-blank that people are like, yeah, I, I don't want that. You know, and that goes back to that whole, they'll know us because of our love for one another. Church, there's so many times, man, we've, we've kicked each other around and the enemy sat in his deck chair thinking, dude, I don't, I don't have to do anything. They're doing it for me. You and I are called to be such a great witness to him that people just want to come and they want to be around you. They want to know what is it that you've got. I need that. I want that. I want the world, starting with this city, to know that mountain life is a refuge, is a safe place. Man, those guys love each other. They are living Jesus to the max. Amen, church? I don't know why I got on that, but it was good. I want you to write this down. Ecclesiastes 5.10. It says, those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. It's like, man. Dude, I I mean, does does God know how to speak it or what? 
You see, we live in a culture that constantly encourages us to pursue more, more money, more possessions, more status. And Jesus is calling us to be a different kind of person, to have a different standard. He's reminding us that true value isn't in abundance or possession. It's in a relationship with him, allowing his Holy Spirit to work in and through you. Blessings in one hand, I'm going to give it out with the other. This is a kingdom dynamic. And we need to ask ourselves, what are we storing up? Are we storing up treasure here? Or are we storing up treasure that's going to be everlasting? You see, God's calling us to be good stewards of the blessing that he's given us. And it's all to further his kingdom. To further his kingdom. Are you living for eternal impact? I was like, man, am I, God, am I there? Am I there? Am I living for this? Am I living for eternal impact? And see, that evolved, that, that, that involves me aligning my priorities with God's heart. It's about being generous. It's about managing my finances to, to not only take care of me and my family, but, but to be a blessing to others around me. It's about me managing my talent. I hope I've got some talent. It's about me sharing the love of Christ. I am called to be a person of love, walking in love, constantly sharing that love. And everything that God's given me, I should freely give it away. No, I'm being honest. There's times, uh uh-uh. I mean, if you watch me eat, don't be sticking your fork in my plate. Uh -uh. And it's funny, Trace is not in here, but, you know, Trace is one of those, like, oh, let me try it. I'm like, man, I'll be stuck. Get your hand away, woman. But, you know, I laugh, but, But God wants us to be a generous people. And you know, there's times in church like we talk about generosity and everybody assumes money. No. No, it's it's you just hanging out with somebody and doing coffee. You know, it's about sharing your time. It's about sharing the word. I think one of the greatest things that we have that we do not share enough of is that deposit that Christ has put in you and I. And there's times we don't share that. And God's saying, no, that's, that's one of those blessings that I've given you. That's one of those talents that I want you to share. It's about recognizing that our lives are part of a bigger story. It's God's story. And that he desires to use us to make a difference in the world. You know what, years ago... I was sort of lost in my journey. I remember this awesome woman back in the Tri-Cities, you know, just a God-fearing lady, loves the Lord, served the Lord with all of her heart for her entire life. And I remember I was sort of on this, for lack of better words, I was on the run. I was like, God, I'm done. I don't want any part of this anymore. And it wasn't that I was deconstructing because we got a whole group of people that are deconstructing that. It's like, dude, how can you stay a piece of scripture like in Psalms? Taste and see that the Lord is good. How can you give that up? I've tasted and I've seen that the Lord is good. And it wasn't I wanted to give up on the Lord. I wanted to give up on this. I'd been beat up and kicked down too many times. And I remember I was, I was back in a way... And this, this lady sent me this verse, and this is Matthew 6, It says, but first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And I remember, it's like, man, if I stick in with the bad times, because that's what it came down to, 
I was sick of the bad times of getting kicked around. I'll be honest with you, the greatest days of my life have been in ministry. The worst days of my life have been in ministry. But I go back to this, and it's like it's his kingdom. The big picture, it's his story, and I'm a part of it. And he has blessed me to do this. You see, and the thing is, it's not about what I can amass. It's not about the, the stuff that I have. It's about him. You know, I said this earlier. It's about whatever God's given me. I can hold it with open hands. It's like, God, if you want to take this and you want to bless somebody else, I want to be a blessing. Where's she at? I, oh, she's right there. She's taking notes. Come on, girl. Well, look at this. It's only 20 till. Okay, I got another six pages to go. I want to ask us this. And I've said this, but I want to go back to it. The eternal impact. I mean, when it's all said and done and you end up going home and you stand in front of Jesus, I mean, do you want him to sit there and say, you did good, but... You know, you ever been around a boss like that? Oh, yeah, great job, but... It's like, here it comes. You see, this is my challenge for us is that when you go home and he's there with that big smile on his face, arms open wide, man, dude, you were just on fire. And there's nothing left in your gas tank. You know, people have said, man, you're getting a little fat right there, but see, there's more gas in my tank. I just got more room for the Holy Spirit to move. Right, brother? But see, this is, this is the mindset that we have to get in. We have to have a surrendered heart that's seeking God above all else. Everything I own belongs to Him. My desire should be in Him. What does He want to do with the stuff that I have? And here's the thing, he's not asking you to, to give me a, well, he is asking you to give me a Corvette. But uh, he's not asking you to give away stuff. But he's asking for your priority to be in the right place. Oh, was you amen in the Corvette? Talk to me after. Um, but he's asking us for our priorities to be in the right place. You know, I just, I love the saying, you are blessed to be a blessing. You know, I, I say this about Pastor Joe, because he's not here, so I can like, I'm not going to throw him under the bus. But dude, the guy will go out of his way to bless someone. And it's funny, because there's times I've sat there and I'm just like, man, he's like giving it all. But you see the look on his face. It's like, dude, that is awesome. Because it was never about what he had. It was about blessing somebody else. But then it became a blessing to him. And I looked at his, his countenance and everything just changed. It's like, dude, that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. You see, and that's, that's the kingdom that you and I live in. That the reality of God is, if you're holding your possessions like this, okay, he'll put it in one hand, he'll take it out of the other, but then the beauty is he puts it back in that hand and takes it out, and, and it's like, how does that work? How does that work? My hand's full, I'm giving it away, and then it's full again. And this is the beauty of the God that we serve, that he wants to bless you and I, but he doesn't want us to hoard it. He doesn't want that to be the focus. God doesn't owe you and I one thing, one thing. 
But I tell you what, he wants to bless you beyond all measure. He wants you to succeed in life. He wants you to have the abundant life. But he wants to partner with you and he wants to know that you are going to trust in him every step of the way. As we go into this week, this is the challenge that I'm putting for me, but I'm also laying out for us as a family. Evaluate where you are and the trust that you place in God. You see, am I trusting? Oh, that hit. Am I trusting? That's what happens, kids, when you get old. Good job, I didn't fall off the stage. <laughs> um, you know, this is the challenge that I'm, I'm asking myself. I, I'm evaluating myself. What am I putting my trust in? Am I trusting in that which is around me, the stuff? Or am I trusting in Him? You see, there's areas in our life where we need to let go of self-sufficiency and rely on God. You know, we need to shift our priorities and align who we are with his heart. You see, these areas where there's been misplaced priorities, is there a, a shifting that needs to take place in my thinking? Am I rich towards God? Or am I running on empty? Am I investing in the eternal? Because the reality is, any one of us could walk out of this building today, and this could be the last time that we're hanging out together as a family. And I'm not a gloom, doom, end time preacher. In fact, I'm living, and I'm living Christ right now. Paul said it like this, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Are we living for Christ? Or is Christ like a secondary on the back burner? It's like, man, I need to heat it up. Praise the Lord. Put him on the back burner. I've been there. I've been there where it's times, man, God, I need, I, I need you right now. I need you to show up. I need you to do this. Okay, we're done. And then I'm off 20 miles down the street, and God's like, dude, you've left me behind. Where's your priorities today? Where is your trust today? How are you living your life today? What needs to change? What needs to change? Because here's the beautiful thing. Every time we come in this building, doesn't matter how plugged in we are, there's always something that God's like, can we just take that? So the beautiful thing is, I can't be wrong, right? That was inside, well, it was a joke. A joke. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you stand before I have a man to come back. I, I want to pray. But I truly want us to take inventory of who you are in Christ. I mean, there shouldn't be a day in life that we're not evaluating who we are. Because I'll be honest with you, there's days where I'm I'm Sean Thomas and I'm just doing things, and God's like, well, what's going on, dude? What do you mean, what's going on? Like, stop. Get back in the line. I just want you to close your eyes and just... I want God just to, to deposit into us that that we need to move forward. I feel like that there's just people in this room today, you feel like you're stuck in this holding pattern. It's like a plane just 
you know, you're doing that circle as you're coming in to land, and yet something's going on on the runway, and the tower just has you circling. And I'm just believing this for you today, that God is going to speak that which you need to hear. And I think it's going to be clear, it's going to be concise, and God's going to say, this is the direction you need to take. Trust in me. Trust in me. And it goes back to what Matthew said, what Jesus said in Matthew. First seek. First seek my kingdom, not your kingdom. My kingdom. And Father, as we confess that there's often times that we've chased the wrong things, help us find our security in you, not in our possessions, not in that which we can attain out of our own steam, but Lord, I pray that you teach us to depend on you in every area of our lives. Give us the wisdom to prioritize what truly matters to you. What truly matters to you. And Lord, I pray for each person here, Lord, that as we leave this place, Lord, we won't just walk out and like church is done and totally dismiss what you've said. But Lord, I pray that you would challenge each one of us to the heart of who we are. Lord, if there's areas in our life, Lord, that are out of balance, I pray by your spirit, Lord, that you would just put us back in alignment with what you want to do. Lord, I pray that we would be hearers of the word, and Lord, we would be doers of the word. Lord, I pray that your truth would just be deposited into each person here today, that, Lord, we would hear what the Spirit's saying. Lord, give us spiritual ears to hear, spiritual eyes to see, but Lord, I pray that our spirit would be so in tune with your spirit, Lord, that we wouldn't miss what you want to do. Because Lord, there is a blessing in this room. I'm looking around. There's blessings all over the place in this room. Lord, you're calling people today to be a blessing to those on the outside that need to see you. So Lord, I pray that your spirit would move through each person here. Lord, that there would be an impartation that would be undeniable. And by your spirit, Lord, I pray that you shut the mouth of the enemy. That he has no place, has no say, has nothing to do. But Lord, you would empower. Lord, and I pray that we would be the kinds of people that would take every thought captive. That we would submit it to your spirit. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you come alive in each person. Come alive, come alive in each person. For such a time as this, Lord, you've placed us here now in this place to move your kingdom. So Holy Spirit, I say by your power, by your might, move through each person here. And today you may be in this place and you may be asking, I want this. I want this. I don't want to be caught up on what the world has to offer, but I want to be caught up on what Jesus has to, to offer. I'm praying with you today that if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is who the Bible says Jesus is, you shall be saved. You shall be saved. It's as easy as that. And here's my encouragement to you. If that's you today, if that's what you want, there's going, to be, there's going to be a prayer team on each side of this room as we dismiss. I want you to come up and just say, I, I want to give my life to the Lord. They will pray with you. They will seal that which the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. God, we want more of you. Lord, I know there's a room full of people here that are saying, God, we want more of you. 
let our eyes not be on our possessions, but Lord, let our hearts thank you for all that we have, but let our eyes be on you. Let us trust in you every step of the way because you came to do life and you came to do it with us. You chose each one of us to be a part of your family. So Lord, we honor you. We bless you. We lift you up. We glorify you. No greater name than the name of Jesus. No greater place to be than in the presence of the Almighty. So Lord, move in this place, in this town, in this valley, in this state, in this country, in this world. Take back what is yours. What is yours. Amen and amen.